A very good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vignesh, and I'd like to welcome you to our third Making Headway series, Bridging the Gaps in Remote Learning. We at the Head Foundation are truly honored to put together this series and to share with you insights and experience from practitioners, from academics and researchers across the region as they grapple with remote learning during these trying times. Today, in our third session, we look at how some innovators across the region have rehashed some older technologies to ensure that learning loss is minimized and that students are able to continue learning even if they are deprived of access to the latest technology available. Ladies and gentlemen, today is the third session in our three-part series. And sadly, it's the last session for this series. But I know that today's session is going to be insightful for all of you who have attended, and you'll have an opportunity to learn from the innovations that our speakers have implemented in their schools and their systems, and hopefully take some of these innovations back to your own system. So ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, let me introduce our moderator for this series, Dr. Kamela Orishon, who will introduce our speakers and lead today's session. Dr. Orishon, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Sir Vignesh, and everyone at the Head Foundation, our esteemed panelists and participants. We are happy to welcome our new participants and to welcome back the participants who have been with us in the past sessions. We note with gladness and gratitude that a number of you have been attending the series since the first session. Today, we are excited to bring you the third session in this three-part webinar series on the theme, Bridging the Gaps in Remote Learning. We are very optimistic that you will learn a lot from the sharing of our three panelists this afternoon. As the theme implies, this activity was conceived by the Head Foundation to offer useful ideas and inspiring stories of how fellow educators in the region attempted to confront the wicked consequences of the pandemic on education, specifically the education of the young people. This webinar series began with a session on working with the community last June 17, followed by the session on using digital tools last week, and we have rehashing older technology today, as mentioned by Sir Vignesh. In this practitioner-focused series, we explore a wide spectrum of educational technologies and show how an inclusive and engaging teaching learning process is still possible during a difficult situation such as the present pandemic and also doable even in under-resourced schools. Technology, we all know, can be very intimidating, especially for those among us from vulnerable environments. It can connote all the state-of-the-art equipment and tools and comprehensive learning management systems or powerful apps, which we long to have, but unfortunately do not have or are not within reach, at least at the moment, for many of us. Through the presentations last week, our panelists have in a very inspiring manner encouraged us to keep on. It has been very motivating to note how scarcity of resources has actually brought out the best in our panelists. We saw how a potentially catastrophic situation in our schools was somehow averted by the extraordinary resourcefulness and unwavering determination of school leaders and teachers to protect the future of our young people by keeping them in school, in school, in quotation marks. In the first session, we saw how scarcity prompted our schools 
to involve in strategic ways the different sectors of the local community and the larger society to keep teaching and learning going. Last week, we saw how scarcity led Ms. Sabrina Onkiko and her colleagues to discover the surprising possibilities that are feasible through Facebook Messenger. Do you remember Angel, the robot assistant of Mom Sabrina? How interesting. But beyond being an interesting, nice to know initiative, that was a consolation for students, especially during trying times. It was also a big help to teachers as well. We also saw through the presentation of Ms. Auri Santos, the wide collection of instructional materials at Simeo Inotech, which are available and accessible to educators for various specific purposes. We encourage you to use those materials to help you with your tasks and goals. The pandemic was truly unexpected, sudden, and dramatic. It brought to the fore so much uncertainties and fragility related to the education process. It also brought to the center the vulnerabilities in the education system, including the inequalities in accessing good education, especially during a situation that required a gigantic leap from physical interactions to distance learning. Ms. Sabrina and Ms. Auri offered some concrete responses to the crisis. On his part, Professor Ban Haryak, reminded us about important questions to consider so that responses to crises such as this pandemic we are continuing to navigate are truly meaningful and relevant. I think that through the questions proposed by Sir Banhar, we can avoid both ready-made solutions or idea of the week solutions. It is our privilege to bring to you today three panelists who will share with us how we can continue to bridge gaps related to remote learning. Mr. Tirawat Duanrit is currently director of Buddha Jakritaya School, OBEC in Thailand. Prior to this role, he was a teacher and then deputy director at Rajadamri School, Bangkok. He holds a doctorate degree in educational administration. Dr. Yolanda Marin Gonzalez is principal four of Tapas National High School in the Philippines. An epitome of servant leadership, she has been recognized as an outstanding principal for several years in the division and national levels of the Department of Education because of her exemplary and unselfish work for the department. She completed her doctorate degree from Tarlac State University, a university in Central Luzon, Philippines. Mr. Jayton Zulueta is the executive director and founder of AHA Learning Center, a nonprofit organization that has helped thousands of parents, teachers, and students in the Philippines during the pandemic. Jayton is a multi-awarded teacher, a community organizer, and a broadcaster. For his work, Jayton has recently been awarded the Obama Foundation Leader Award. He works with education groups in the Philippines and abroad. Similar to what we did during the first two sessions, let us start the ball rolling through a question that we would like the participants to answer. Here's the question. This proceeds from the previous week, uh, Paul, where we found out that 50% of our learners actually didn't seem to have learned what they were expected to learn. So here's the question. What do you think is the main reason behind the learning loss no, that was um, uh, represented by the poll last week? Okay. First, lack of instructional devices and materials. Second choice, loss of motivation on the part of teachers and students. 
Third choice, lack of training for teachers on the use of old and new technology. And finally, fourth choice, non-priority of education continuity by the government in the fight against COVID-19. We invite you, our dear participants, to respond to the question. We shall see the results of the poll a bit later. In the meantime, we shall proceed. This afternoon, we will have Mr. Tirawat Luanrit or Dale come first. He will share with us what they did to help students have a positive learning experience and teachers have a professional online teaching experience. Dale, the screen, the screen is yours now. I'm from Putajak Vitiya School. Putajak Vitiya School is a small school in the center of Bangkok. We have many uh, different background students come to study with us. But we are so lucky we have supported by Thai government and uh, Wat Warampong Temple for our financial to manage in COVID-19 situation. So uh, in this situation, uh, we focus on teacher and student. Uh, we think how to help students have a positive learning experience and how to help teacher has a professional online teaching. Before we start work with uh, this situation with student and teacher, we use pay model. Pay that is a bag. In Thai, we use bag. Student will use bag to put their material, education material, to go to school for study. But in this situation, COVID-19, we cannot come to school. So we use pay model to work in this time. P does mean pair, plan and prepare. A action, E evaluate. We start with online survey. So we need to get information for about teacher and students and parents. After we get information online survey, we will brainstorming to choose the right way for work together. So in this picture, you will see that our teacher at Putajak Vitiya School, we come to share and uh, choose the right way to get the, to work in this situation. And uh, we find out from the survey, online survey that uh, we have about 19.1% of students have PC. And we have 35.1% of students have notebook. And about 12.8% say they have tablet. And most of students at Putajak Vichaya, Vichaya, they have a smartphone. But 92.6% say they don't have a, a that doesn't mean they including internet connecting. So which platform does they use in Putajak Vichaya student? So most of students use live for communicate, including live video call and live chat. And we have some they use Zoom and Google Meet. So work design in Putajak Vichaya, we have five way of teaching students for teaching students. So on site, students have to learn at the school. In COVID-19 situation, we cannot come to school, so we cannot on site in this time. On air, Thai government, we have DLTV. This is education program, so we can use on air. Online, that means they use internet for communicate with teacher on the real time. We can teach real time on uh, online. On demand, on demand, that's we have a uh, application, for example, YouTube, website, video clip, but students have to have inter internet connection too. On hand, that means teachers have to prepare books and paperwork for students that they can take home for work and study. So when we have get information about online survey, we talking about what the choose way that we can do at Putajak Vichyasukhu. So 
percentage we decide to online but online teaching sometimes students cannot internet connection for the whole time to study for communicate with teacher so we including on air on demand and uh, 63.5% said we de they decide for on hand, but we include on air and telephone call. That's we call high beach learning. So after we get information, put a jack with us who we decide to support teacher. So uh, the what Bolampong temple they support us by the PC and tablet for teacher who don't have it. That's they can be the best teacher for online teaching. And moreover, we get the financial to make the internet room, free Wi-Fi for teacher that they can come to school and use if they don't want to work at home. And on hand, teacher come to the school and they prepare uh, for the books this this uh, plastic bag we call education bag we put book and paperwork or homework for teacher and we call students and parents come to school and pick it to uh, back home and study by themselves online in the action this picture will show you that uh, we support teacher to online teaching so you can see the face of teacher this is a map big math teacher. She's so happy that they, she prepared the material and uh, teaching in her class, in math class. And students student will come to join in the class and they can communicate. So we use many applications, for example, like Facebook, Google Meet. And on hand, like I said, we prepare the material in the plastic bag or education bag and call parents come to get it at the school. But some students cannot come to school. We post it to their address. And moreover, we visit their family and give them by ourselves. And uh, sometimes when students uh, study in many different ways, they need more uh, learning we including telephone call so we support teacher for the telephone bill this picture teacher explained about the lesson with the student this picture about science education class evaluate online this this picture will show you the green color that uh uh, show you how many students come to join in the class. So th there are a little to, to come to the class because most of students at Puttajak Vichya School, they don't have internet connection. After they study and communicate with teacher in the class, they will do homework and then they will send back by take a picture. And on hand, as them, um, uh, like I said, they will start the education book, paperwork, and uh, after they read and study by themselves, they will take uh, a picture about her work and send to teacher. Teacher can check how much they understand the lesson. And if they misunderstand the lesson, teacher will call back and explain more for the student who don't have internet connect connection. So key learn, learning point with Puttajak Vichya School in COVID-19 situation. Uh, I have to encourage teacher by uh, bill or everything that I can support them. And after we work for uh, COVID-19 situation, we when we have problems with working, we have to adapt able, like we including telephone call. And the best thing is teamwork. We cannot walk alone, so we have to walk together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that presentation, Dale. Thank you. The photos were very helpful. It's as though we went to visit your school in Bangkok. Thank you. And maybe <laughs> when we can travel again, some of us can visit your school to learn more from you. Yeah. Indeed, as you ended your presentation, teamwork is very important. Yes. It is necessary also to be adaptable or flexible in unusual situations, yes. as you stated. 
And finally, encouraging one another makes a difference in a difficult and sometimes scary journey. I also admire the extra step of your staff going out of their way to call the students. Once again, thank you very much, Dale. Thank you. From Bangkok, Thailand, we shall now proceed to Tarlac in the Philippines. Wow. If this tiny virus thinks it has succeeded to cripple us, we should show it the many good things that came with the pandemic it caused, such as webinars like the one we're having today. From Tarlac in the Philippines, Ma'am Yolanda will share with us how they addressed the pandemic-related challenges they faced through radio-based instruction. Many of us may not have seen one at all, Maybe we have forgotten about transis transistor radios. But let's all listen. The session may inspire us to use radio-based instruction, even those among us with access to state-of-the-art equipment and tools or learning management systems. Ma'am Yolanda Gonzalez, you may now proceed with your presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Yolanda Marin Gonzalez from Capas National High School, Tarlac Province, Philippines. Radio is an older technology that is used as an alternative learning mode to deliver basic education in the new normal. Radio has been playing a vital role in the field of communication since its origin. In in the year 1930s, mark the use of radio in the Philippine arena. For Capas National High School, there are three key issues to consider in putting up radio-based instruction. The first one is learner needs. Based on the survey that we have during the month of April and May, there are 14% of our total enrollment wants to have or want to have radio-based instruction as their learning modality. The second issue is struggling learners. These are learners who work harder than others but do not have other means to acquire education. And paper-based modules are expensive. Here is the implementation plan of Capas National High School in utilizing RBI, radio-based instruction, as our learning modality. First, Site identification and construction of RBI room, procurement and setting up of RBI tools and equipment, and number three step, conduct training and workshop for RBI and technical assistance. Then preparation of RBI scripts, learning activity sheet, and the schedule. After that, the launching of the RBI and the implementation of Capas National High School Official Radio DWRY 103FM. The benefits in using RBI as our learning modality, first one, alternate, alternate way for the marginalized students, responsive to the basic needs and interests of the clientele, less expensive, develop students' talents and broadcasting. The uses of Capas National High School radio, DWRY, your dream radio, it is used for school announce, schools announcement, hosting talk shows, providing information and promoting culture. For instance, our special program in foreign language, Nihongo and Chinese Mandarin, and discussing most essential learning competencies in all learning areas, give an opportunity for the learners to develop, to develop their skills and talents in broadcasting. And we use radio as our tool in bridging learning gaps. The impacts of the DWRY, your, your dream radio, it reached out 6,936 students, but benefited more than 10,000 external and internal stakeholders because of our extension program for the National Certificate in Technical Vocational Education. Improve student performance, equip teachers with the strategy in teaching and writing scripts, easy and pre-access, 
develop teachers and student self-confidence, and for the millennium, the de millennium development goal of the Philippine government that education is for all for Kapas National High School, we make sure that no student will left behind. The obstacle we face along the utilization and the implementation of the RBI as our learning modality. First, poor internet connectivity, financial constraint, insufficient number of two-way transistor radio per student for the 14%. And the solution that we come out in order to resolve the issue, we have partnership and networking with the different internal and external stakeholders for funding the transistors and other parapernalia in our radio station. And procurement of two-way two -way transistor radios is sponsored by the LGU. Another obstacle, the geographic location and effect of COVID-19. The solution that we have is we put a 30 kilometer radio, radio station, DWRY FM operated and owned by the school to reach out our students the best way we can. In case that there is an affected area for COVID, we have pre-recorded radio broadcasts, scripts for our learners to transport learning competencies from backward to forward time. And the key points we learn in putting up radio station, this is the value of wearing hat. Hat for Kapas National High School teaching and non-teaching staff we work together as one, no matter what should be our position, in order to give the best possible education to our learners. These are the value of hard work, acceptance, and teamwork. And the next key point is Project Kite, Knowledge Integration in Technology Education. The KITE strategy has three parts. The vital parts of the KITE, the first one is the light frame covered are our students or learners who entrusted to us to be knowledgeable, skilled, and imbued with proper attitudes and values. And the longest string, our internal and external stakeholders who are very supportive in all our endeavors in the school in financing all and give funds in buying transistor radio in putting up this radio station. And let's, let us not forget the person who hold and navigate the string, the teachers and the principal who encourage the learners to stand tall and soar high towards their dream. If you notice in this presentation, there is a time allotment per subject from Monday to Friday, which is 20 minutes. And then there are two types of script that we prepared. The first one is SOA, is School on Air, and the second, the second one is Dramatic Approach. The difference between the two for Dramatic Approach, there is a time, technical instruction, and spill. These are the trainings that was conducted in the month of August for our teachers to be well prepared in the preparation of their RBI script. And the last key point that we have is the reflection on the acronym success. If you notice in the ladder, we have set our goal and we need to understand there are many obstacles, especially in funding. And we need to create a positive mental picture or an environment for us to give what is best for our learners. We need to clear our minds of self-doubts, embrace the challenges, no matter what hindrances, we need to face out that all educators are catalysts of change. We need to stay focused in the implementation, in putting up implementation, implementation and using RBI as our learning modalities. And we need to show to the world that this is the best practices of Kapas National High School, we can do it despite it is pandemic. The three key lessons learned in putting up 
registration as our learning delivery modality is that we have an optimism in providing basic quality education among our learners. We have gives a positive outlook in leading to high performance. The next one is resiliency, make us survive in difficult times. And we know for a fact that having radio-based instruction is cost efficient and develops imagination because of the different types of the preparation of script and uh, different principles in RBI, which fosters creativity. For this time, may I invite everyone to please watch our video, how we conduct RBI in our school. Good day to all. I am your teacher, broadcaster, Tui A. Sinizal. I hope you are all doing great. We are here again for another thrilling lesson. Today, you are going to learn composing a research report on a relevant issue. Our goals are to, number one, identify the characteristic of a good research topic. Two, develop a research title. Three, write a research introduction on a relevant social issue, and four, formulate research questions related to the objectives of the research introduction. Please grab your pen and notebook now for writing up important points. With that, the solution of our school, radio-based instruction is the doorway to wisdom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation, Ma'am Yolanda. We laud you and your team for initiating or rather reviving radio-based instruction. Thank you for sharing with us the many purposes, intended and unintended, that the initiative served you. The image of a kite is inspiring. I think everyone in the audience will agree that truly we each hold a string an important string that must be held properly, pulling and unwinding it as needed so that the kite does not crash, so that the students entrusted to our care continue to fly high. Now we are ready to listen to our third panelist. Mr. Jayton Zulueta will share with us their initiatives to reach those who are most vulnerable in terms of access to good education in line with leaving no one behind. You have the screen now, Jayton. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Orashon, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I'm here to represent AHA Learning Center, a nonprofit organization that hopes to create the next generation of role model Filipino citizens. Role model Filipino citizens who are college graduates ready to work, community leaders ready to serve the community, and global citizens ready to change the world. Since 2009, we achieved these goals through our interventions, our academic interventions, our social emotional interventions, and our parent and teacher support intervention. Last year, uh, with the pandemic, um, our impact grew to 3 million uh, students reached for our, um, due to our partnerships with different government agencies and local uh, government units or mayors. We trained over 110,000 teachers on Zoom on how to prepare for the pandemic, uh, education in the pandemic, whether it was learning facilitation or how to deal with parents. Today, we are here to talk about one of our programs, a radio-based program where we have produced um, over 200 hours of educational radio and TV in, our national, um, in a national radio station, which also has a uh, cable. Um, we produced 200 hours. So it's, this is not a technical talk. Um, I am here to talk about uh, our effort of doing this for the last year and a half. We have partnered with countless people we have produced uh, with different artists and writers our own educational content. This is of um, a dad and his uh, and his 
his wife talking to a, to a student to their child about going out and how important it was to be a little more safe. We also had different um, mental health projects like this where we where we talked about um, poetry. This says, "Mumiti ka sa akin, uh, smile for us." And since most of our um, viewership were deaf, since a lot of the special schools closed, we had in every show a sign language interpreter. Our fatal mistake was that we thought that we, we were only teaching radio the same way we did online classes. Our radio was a different beast and we had to recognize how different it was. Um, even if there was a TV element, even if there was an online element, uh, we couldn't do it the same way. Radio was all about intimacy, was all about speaking to one person. So for us to be effective as teachers, we had to understand what the best radio programs had in common. And when we looked at everything that was on air at the time, even in our, in our own radio station, a lot of it had to do with stories. So one of the key things was, were we presenting stories that um, our students, that represented our students, that our students seemed to hear? And during this time, we had, um, like most of the Philippines, been paralyzed by COVID-19. And we had one story in particular that stood out that kept sadly repeating. Rona, 11 years old, died of meningitis. Uh, I remember distinctly talking to her mother. What do you say to a mother who lost their child? What do you say to their siblings? These were things that we couldn't find any lessons for. Uh, it was difficult to teach math and English that day. So we decided to use our platform to, change, to, teach, um, to teach something that the kids actually needed to hear at the time. For Rona, Aha was her happy place. So we decided that um, it was safe for her when we were still doing face-to-face -face classes. She would come in, use the library, use the computer. So we, so we thought that maybe if we made the radio programs more like a place where children feel welcome, loved, and seen, then that would help us not only further the lessons that we had, to, we had to teach in English and math, but also that would help us in our overall education program to be a little more holistic. At this point, um, we used that story, which was a story of grief, and told it in different ways. We invited people like Kurt, who lost his father, mother, and sister even prior to the pandemic. He talked about how it's okay to accept the fact that it never that the loss and that the depression it never goes away. The hurt always stays with you. Um, there will be good and bad days, but it does get better. We talked to um, developmental behavioral uh, psychiatrists who were willing to give key tips for parents and kids to deal with grief and loss. They might not have lost a, a person in their family, but they might have lost this feeling of freedom and joy that goes with face-to-face -face classes. We guested Bobby Guevara, a theology professor from Ateneo University, who framed loss in general in the context of fear and bravery. For him, bravery isn't when we have no fear. Bravery is when we are afraid but continue anyway. This helped us um, become sort of a compass to how we would make our shows. And this helped uh, inspire us to create guidelines. First guideline was that we always had to answer a simple question, not only in our radio shows, actually even in our materials, in our phone calls, in the printed materials that we, do, that we would send out, in the text-based learning materials that we did with uh, last week's panelist, Sabrina and Kiko. Um, we had to ask what's causing our community pain. If we address that first, then the, most likely the students will be open to hear the things that we're teaching. The second guideline was every lesson could have the possibility of a deeper subtext. So when we thought about um, English, it wasn't just about grammar. Uh, we taught English about, about meaning. It's about meaning and communication. It's not important that, it's important that your grammar is right so that people can understand you better. When we talked about math, it wasn't about numbers, it was about values. What we value 
and how we communicate what we value with each other. We were lucky that we found partners whose content we could be could be repurposed. Uh, I guess the old adage, it doesn't that let we should not reinvent the wheel rings true during these times. Many partners, whether it was the office of the vice president, whether it was um, the Department of Education and Department of Health, Health, were willing to partner because we had airtime. And there were international partners like Rising Academies, which had um, given 500 of the radio scripts for free. If you go to their website, risingacademies.org, you don't even have to log on and you will find 500 um, English as a second language text and math lessons for grade one to six. Radio was not just about one person to the other, but it, on the back end, it was made by a community of collaborators. And this is why um, our finale for this radio project is that from 11 hours a week of producing content, we have 11 hours on air every week, we decided to do one hour a week. And for that one hour, it was our community that would host, write, and produce the show. It was important for them, I guess, for this last phase uh, to transition as we transition slowly into face-to-face -face classes, that they would have their own voice. Um, a lot of skill sets, as Mam Yolanda said, would be tested here. Not only writing, not only speaking, but also how they form their thoughts and opinions. And if they wanted to talk about BTS and why that's a good, good, the best band in the world, we would let them have it. If we can talk about BTS a little bit, but talk about the lessons that we take up at, at our center, uh, equity, justice, uh, the importance of empathy. I come to you humbly uh, after this one year of experiments um, that we've been away with one simple lesson, that even as we work from home, we can work from hope. Even if we're far away, there are ways that we can connect with each other. Work from hope for us became a rallying cry because what it meant was that we, even in our small ways, can make our students' lives better, even if we didn't see them, even if we couldn't hear them. Um, we could still be teachers. Work from hope now rings a little different as we rage on with the pandemic, as we realize that it wasn't just about our work, but about how our work is affecting the students. So we work from hope because we believe that everything that we do um, matters, counts, and maybe, hopefully, uh, years down the line, we can find that our students will pay it forward and leave our country better than, than, than then they came through it. Maraming salamat po. Tayong pagbabago ating hintay. We are the change we've been waiting for. Po. Thank you very much, Jayton, for your presentation, especially the lessons that you have learned in the course of pursuing the center's mission. We thank you for reminding all of us that bridging the gaps in remote learning cannot just be as simple as transplanting pre-pandemic teaching learning practices from an old pot to a new one. We thank you for emphasizing that usual lessons such as, for example, subject-verb agreement or multiplication of fractions or identifying the different states of matter cannot just be lectured and forced upon the students. Lessons have to be carefully planned with the context of the students a specific consideration that should not be ignored. I think you powerfully emphasize the importance of uh, giving attention to the context of the students. A year ago, the pandemic caught all of us by surprise and it spared no aspect of life. We know that the sudden closure of schools caused brutal disruptions in education. It wasn't a simple matter of making alternative plans, implementing these plans, then getting back on our feet business in a new usual mode. Because unfortunately, the pandemic also exacerbated inequalities and thus widened gaps that were already there. It does seems very fitting to end our session today and actually the three-part webinar series on a high note 
through the invitation of Jayton for us to work from hope. These lines that I will say from Lu Jun, a Chinese writer of the 20th century, actually echo the battle cry from the webinar series as suggested by Jayton. Lu Jun once said, hope is a path on the mountainside. At first, there is no path. But then, there are people passing that way. And so then, there is a path. When the pandemic hit, there was no path in sight. But after a year, we see paths to a common destination taking clear shape. These paths have been led by people like our speakers today and in the past sessions of the webinar series and the many more educators in our audience and beyond who have taken on the challenge of producing a path where there was none. That gives us hope that we will be able to pull through. Through new forms of teaching and learning processes, we will be able to make the leaps that are necessary to bridge the gaps that have emerged. So thank you very much once again, Dale, Yolanda, and Jayton for the path that you have created with your colleagues and which you have shared with us this afternoon. Before we proceed to our Q&A, let us see the turnout of the poll that we did a while ago. Let's see. So here, so we asked what you thought would be the main reason behind the learning loss that we perceived last week no? caused by COVID-19. And these are the answers. 33% think it's because of the lack of materials, instructional devices, and materials. 21% think it's because of loss of motivation on the part of teachers and students. 31% think it's because of lack of training for teachers on the use of both old and new technology, while only 15% believe that it's because it's not a priority. No, that education continuity is not a priority of the government in the fight against the virus. So there, the two answers that were um, similarly um, uh, rated were the lack of instructional materials and devices and the lack of training for teachers on the use of both old and new technology. So there, that's very interesting. Maybe we'll have a chance to go back to that later. But in the meantime, we'd like to proceed to our Q&A. I have browsed through the questions in the Q&A portion of our Zoom uh, webinar need. And I'd like to address the first two questions to Dale. Uh, there are two questions here addressed to Dale. Uh, one, uh, they, the audience would like to know if you encounter students or parents who refuse to cooperate you know, with the initiatives of the school and how you address the challenges you know, that was uh, presented by that. Also, they would like to know how you uh, responded to the, address, uh, to the challenges presented uh, in relation to assessments especially in terms of integrity of assessment. So Dale, can you kindly share your thoughts on those two questions? Thank you. Um, well, uh, Yushi is very hard time in this situation, but uh, in Kutajak, which is in, in Bangkok, Thailand, we have a COVID-19 situation first time, and then we come back to school in the class, and then COVID-19 come again, and we go back to work at home and three times until now days, uh, number three time. So we have a group line of parents and students. And uh, 
พุทธจักรวิทยาสคูล we don't have a lot of student we have about 200 student so one class we have some student uh, about 15 or some class we have nine students so teacher and student very close to each other so they they are uh, friend they they just not a teacher and student but they are a family so we when we have a situation hard to cooperate cooperation to each other teacher will have a telephone call or make a live group call to talk with the parents and students and we set the goal with students most of students at Puttajak Vitya School they will have they will get a scholarship so if they can they uh, don't come to the class they will not get the scholarship in the future so when they have the plan that I have to go to the class because I will earn the scholarship for study. So it's easy for, for teacher and student and parents because we have goal and we have a uh, communicate in the group together. So uh, and we, we meet often, we, we make a group call, video call often uh, between teacher, teacher, director, teacher and teacher, student, parents too. And uh, in this situation, we have uh, online and on air, oh, oh, sorry, online and on hand. In online about uh, mass assessment, it is very hard because it is not a normal time. So students will, will work at, uh, will study at home. So online, sometimes when teacher in the online, online internet class are uh, teaching, we can have a question and ask them. So we can get the score for them or give them a score if they answer something about in the class. It doesn't mean we don't need to make the paper test for the full paper test, same the normal time. Teacher can have a question in the class, in the online. And we, we have many subjects. We cannot study the all time in the one day. So we, we integrate integration. That means many subjects, we come to talk together. Teacher will talk and can uh, integrate the job and paperwork for one, one, one job together and in on hand after they they make paperwork we make a telephone call to ask them how how they understand the lesson and we can give them for assessments too yes ma'am okay thank you very much dale i didn't realize that you have gone back and forth uh from uh in school teaching and learning to remote learning that's interesting to note so I'm sure that you have really learned a, a, a lot no, about the different practices. And I'd like to thank you for thank the you. strategies that you shared related to the questions that were po posed from our audience. Okay? Now, let me bring to the screen, Ma'am Yolanda. There are two questions, Ma'am Yolanda, that I'd like to direct to you. Um, one... Um, is about the assessment as well. So maybe you can proceed no, from uh, what Dale has discussed. How is assessment conducted specifically in relation to radio-based instruction? And there's a particular subject-related question here. How do you teach science through radio-based instruction? Ma'am Yolanda, can you help us with those two questions? Okay, Thank you, Ms. O. For the assessment that we conducted uh, using radio-based instruction, teachers posted questions through on air. Uh, the activity, the contextualized activity sheet prepared by the teachers of Capas National High School based on the most essential learning competencies were given uh, prior to the lesson. Then every activity there should be a learning activity sheet given to the uh, to the students with the coordination of the barangay council uh, it is a matter of submission of this activity through paper and pencil that is uh, the thing that we have before that is the reason why in terms of assessment uh, there is a process and performance standard that we look into but this assessment tool are prepared these are contextualized uh, these are prepared by the school, by the teachers, so that we should look. The formative assessment is not the priority of the Department of Education. 
And this can be submitted through paper and pencil by having portfolios and exhibit by our students based on their creativity, critical thinking will be developed. Then the higher order thinking skills will be developed through this assessment. The students have the leeway to prepare their insight on the, uh, on the activity sheet provided by the teachers. And for science classes, the intended number of minutes discussed is 20 minutes. The schedule for our science classes, teachers or students may ask questions through on air to our students. If there are queries, clar clarification, they can post this one through the uh, cell phone. Then the teachers, the cell phone, because every teachers have their own Google class. If the student do not have the internet connection still, they can use their cell phone in order for them to uh, ask the question and have queries and qu clarification on the topic that was discussed by the teachers. Aside from the things that I have said, there are follow-up activities will be given to the student supplement to the learning for the development of their learning uh, skills in such a way that if there are uh, experiment needs to submit by the students, then these are learning activity sheet that can be incorporated in the most essential learning competencies. These are localized and contextualized. The student can lean on their teacher for the submission of this activity. And science class is very interesting because the uh, teacher broadcaster discuss the different uh, scientific names mm -hmm. of and in terms of the uh, equipment uh, apparatus and these are provided with the learning activity sheet before the airing of a certain class or a certain schedule by the science teacher. Okay, thank you very much for those inputs, Ma'am Yolanda. I realized from your uh, sharing that somehow radio-based instruction can be very personal. No? And that's something that we want to encourage. Okay. Thank now, you. I'd like to call upon our third panelist, uh, Jayton, and direct a couple of questions to him. Jayton, you're also, um, you also have experience in radio-based instruction. So there's another question on a subject-specific um, uh, matter that I'd like to direct to you. This time, physical education. How do you conduct physical education classes in radio-based instruction? And maybe somehow related to this, how do you address the needs of special learners no, through the uh, old technology schemes that you have touched on in your presentation, Jayton? Uh, thank you for the, for the questions. Those might be the most difficult questions to ask. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. To, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. But I also, um, I also, we, these are questions that we're all trying to figure out. Um, in terms of physical education, we do not do any physical education classes. Uh, but I think because primarily the students that we're trying to um, target don't have the space in their homes. When they take pictures of them listening to the radio programs, they're often cramped up in small spaces. And oftentimes, um, they cannot go out because of the COVID restrictions. However, I feel like the physical education over the last year has taken a, on a backseat to the mental health education, which we focus on. Uh, to answer the way we've tackled this, we've tried to figure out how to incorporate not only speaking to the student, but to the parent who is listening. More, all, of our, all of our radio programs are encouraged to be watched as a whole family. Uh, we leave um, the end of each program to ask the parent to have one question where they talk about during meal times. We call this um, Sapang Pamilya, which means uh, conversations with the family. This simple tool has allowed us to check for outcomes because it's much easier, obviously, to ask 
a parent uh, how if they were able to do a particular uh, task than a student. And more so now, all of the conversations are through the parent. In terms of special needs um, students, we found we're still in the process of learning how to deal with special needs students. The big thing that we're trying to figure out is that the parent needs in intensive training to be able to mirror or even go um, a portion of what the special needs teachers do in schools. So this is why one of the big programs that we're doing throughout the year, uh, throughout, after this radio program in the last um, couple of months is starting parent clubs. So what we do with the parent clubs is that we have um, monthly parent clubs where we talk about not only the things that, are that we deal with in the show, but also um, we talk about issues that are relevant to their community. One of the big questions are, uh, that come out often in these parent clubs is how can I support my kid academically when I myself am not academically um, proficient? And one of the things that we have to understand when we make our assessments is that it isn't just a problem in terms of modality or access, or it isn't, it isn't even a problem in terms of will. It might just be capacity. So in the next couple of years, I think we're going to focus more on parent capacity. And I think that's something that uh, all of us in this forum will be working on as the years go by. Thank you very much for that, Jayton. Now I'd like to engage our three panelists. Um, there is a question in the Q and A portion that has something to that, that that is connected to physical interactions. Okay, I think this is because schooling in the past, uh, pre-COVID, was really characterized by a lot of physical interactions, face-to-face -face meetings, face-to-face -face sessions, no and really a lot of physical engagement with one another. Um, we'd like to ask our three panelists this afternoon, how have we continued no, to connect the students with one another or connect the teachers with students no, in the modalities that we have started to adopt? Can we start with you, Jayton? So I think... Um... One of the things that we're learning is that we can't put a textbook and convert it into just wholly into online materials. We can't do that. Um, we, what we realize now more than ever where our students are undergoing uh, different levels of trauma is that the lessons that we put out have to restructure that it sounds like a love letter almost. Simple things by um, using inflections in the lesson, um, doing check-ins, uh, having the students also do check-ins with each other. Um, when we do text-based lessons where or messenger classrooms, similar to what Sabrina Kunkiko did last um, presented last week, one of the key things that we have to remember as teachers is that um, the students are already programmed to have some level of intimacy through text and through social media that maybe our generation isn't used to. So they already have that inbred. It's not just about being able to tap into that language, but understanding how they communicate with each other already. So we have students that haven't seen each other that are best friends, um, but talk constantly through text. So it starts with the teacher, but we also have to make sure that we um, I think one of the big problems with online is the child safety issues, that we make it safe for the students to interact with each other because it can get out of hand. All right. Thank you very much for that, uh, Jayton. How about Mom Yolanda? May we hear from you? For Campus National High School, our students have their uh, localized and contextualized modules. We, it was downloaded in our uh, website. It is prepared by our teachers wherein if there are things that they need to ask, uh, all its students have their own uh, registration ID in our apps, then they can text 
if they don't have load, they can uh, upload all the materials because it can be asynchronous and asynchronous learning. Uh, in that case, the student will not left behind because all the available uh, tools, despite we are using radio and the backbone of the radio based instruction is uh, paper based module. And what we did is that aside from online teaching, we have our learning activity sheet given uh, prior uh, to the airing of every lesson that we have. For Campus National High School, we are using blended learning for that for this case. Aside from the paper-based module, we have our television for the reproduction for uh, production of the different learning, most essential learning competencies. And the other one, we have our uh, school apps wherein the students can learn with or without internet. The flexible learning, we're in quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, and quadrant four. It is by uh, it is being discussed for them, so that all the students here in Capas National High School has the way to access to quality education services. We make it a point that relevant quality and responsive education will be given to our students the best way we can. The tool that we need is radio-based instruction, TV-based instruction, and the apps that we develop. And there are contextualized and localized modules prepared by our students, by our teachers rather. And the students should look onto the learning activity sheet prepared by the uh, teachers, it was given to them through the effort and the help of our barangay council. Every barangay we have our end bank, wherein all materials can be looked onto by our students. If this book are not available, there is an end bank in its barangay and all barangay captains and the barangay council in charge of education we tie up with them so that the education will not be forsaken in this in this sense. Thank you very much, Ms. O. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ma'am Yolanda. How about you, Dale? What's your take on this particular question no? on how we were able to maintain connections no? between students, among students, between teachers and students, parents, and as um, mentioned by Ma'am Yolanda, even the local community leaders. Huh? Dale? Thank you, ma'am. Um, in uh, Puttajak Vichya School, we have a PLC or SLC every uh, mon Monday evening uh, start from 2 p.m. That means uh, everyone, every teacher come to meet and share together about their class. And we will talking about the students. And uh, we, we support teacher every morning or uh, Sunday, uh, Monday to Friday, that they will okay. meeting uh, with uh, teacher, uh, student, we call homeroom. Student will come to join in the class and we will talk about uh, life, about uh, uh, education, about learning. So uh, teacher will post to uh, students very much. And some students who cannot wake up early morning, we will have telephone call. Sometimes it's really hard. Hey, hey, hey wake up, wake up to uh, go this time to study. And we, we have to do that because teacher will call to uh, students and we, we love like our family. And uh, when when we have the case that uh, they not join in the class, or when, uh, when we cannot meet them and to come to study, we will use telephone call to parents and ask about uh, what's going on, about a student why not come to the class. And uh, uh, parents can help a lot in this situation because uh, students, when they are alone at home, most of the time they would like to play only game, play game, computer game. But when parents say, remind them, hey, this time you have to study, teacher call parents and parents help uh, teacher. It's work a lot. And after we, we uh, come back to school, I mean, uh, every Monday, uh, Monday PLC, uh, 
we will talk about the problems and we will help each other. Let's make us close to students and parents. And we uh, video call online application is helped a lot and we can take. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dale. So I think from the three panelists, we see that interactions and connections did not stop. No? But through creativity and innovation and, determine, and determination on the part of our school leaders and teachers, this took different forms. Okay, so there, uh, very clearly, connections and interactions did not stop. They continued no, in different ways. Now, I have an interesting question for the three of you. Um, actually, there's a question on whether we are ready to already proceed with face-to-face -face classes in the coming year. But I would like to connect that with another question. So let me put things this way. In your opinion, do you think we are ready to go back to face-to-face -to -face classes in the coming school year? Or perhaps do you think we should go back to face-to-face -to -face classes this school year? But importantly, I'd like to connect that with another question. What have been the best practices that you discovered this past school year, which you think you would like to bring forward not to the uh, future, no? whether we return to face-to-face -to -face classes or not? This time, can we start with you, Dale? Thank you. Uh, well, we just uh, have community meeting with teachers and planning about uh, can we come back to uh, work at the school again. But we think in, in this year it's very hard because uh, the number of COVID-19 is more and more in, in Bangkok. So I think uh, uh, in July, we, we cannot come face to face or in the class. But we have to uh, continue preparing uh, online teaching because uh, it's lucky us, but uh, it's work. First time is very hard when uh, online teaching, when COVID first time in the first. And after first, we come to the class and then we go back to uh, work at home again and then come to uh, class. And this time, number, number third, so in this time, uh, we, we have learned a lot from the past and students, parents, and teachers, we, we know each other know together that we cannot come soon. So we have to keep continue learning online and make it more quality. That's uh, this time we have more and more students join in the class and our uh, their homework is better and better. And uh, the communicate between online teaching is better uh, before the last time. And in my opinion, if we can come uh, in the future, I mean, uh, come to, uh, to the class face-to-face -face study. But I think we have learned a lot from online. It's maybe in the future, we will have high beach learning because sometimes we learn online in the real time. Uh, it's face-to-face -face in the class, but uh, students feel, some people feel so happy online because they don't need to touring with a traffic jam in Bangkok. So I think in the future, our education or our, our learning will change, will have changed in the future. So, but we have to uh, come to school to have uh, education, but we have to including online teaching too. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dale. How about you, Mom Yolanda? What's your own sense? Uh, in my opinion, I think uh, for the Philippines is uh, this is not the right time. And maybe next year is not already, uh, it is not also the right time for us to have a face-to-face -face classes. Because uh, the, uh, COVID is increasing in the Philippines. The number of persons infected by COVID is still increasing. And because of the Indian uh, variant, that is the reason in my case, we need to secure and protect our students the best way we can. Uh, as a matter of fact, the best thing that we need to do in order for us to have a blended learning here in Capas National High School, we need to strengthen our partnership 
with our local community. At first, not only our municipal mayor, the uh, municipal councilor, all the parents, all the barangay council, teachers, and other par private partners are helping us to distribute the modules to, uh, to have a blended learning the best way we can. For the flexible learning that we are using right now, but for uh, it is hybrid learning, uh, we need to look onto the low internet or the low technology what are, what are the needs and interests of our learners? And if this technology can be put in that community for us to have much better blended learning so that we will lessen the paper-based instruction because for Campus National High School, during the first quarter of the school year, we are spending millions in putting uh, in you uh, for the printing of the modules but having a radio based instruction it is only 1121 uh, $1, us dollars and for singaporean dollars it is only 1551 for the philippine peso it is only 56099 for you to have a high class or high tech radio station but a sm uh, for small school, you can have 10,000 for you to build up your radio station. It is a matter of strengthening, excuse me, strengthening our partnership with the community. We need to specify what should be the role and responsibility of the students, the teachers, the principal, the LGU who are helping uh, us in providing quality basic education among our students. And uh, for me, Project Kite, knowledge integration in technology education should not be forgotten in this sense. Why? No matter what technology we are using, the older technology or the latest technology is still the best education that we need to give to our students that, that can showcase the unconditional love that we have. Because according to Secretary of Education, uh, Secretary Jesli Lapus mentioned that Education is key to success. As long as the school leaders, uh, the community leaders have compassionate heart in funding all the necessity of the school and the character of every school leader and the commitment of everyone, I don't think so. That this platform or this uh, blended learning cannot be possible. In this point of pandemic, it's necessary for us to have this blended learning. But a little bit, uh, there should be uh, an experiment that must done for the special class or for a special program, like for instance, the science technology education, if possible, this special science curriculum, we will have a face-to-face -face with the help of IATF, how we can provide, provide best uh, education with safety and protection among our students. That is the best thing that we need to do for this case. And uh, this time I would like to express my gratitude to our SDS for bringing out these best practices in our country. Our SDS, Ronaldo Poson, for giving me the chance to share the best practices that we have here in Tarlac province. And thank you very much to each and every one of you. Thank you very God much, bless. Yolanda. So I guess there's more to be done. But uh, having heard from your experience, we know that you can really do all those, no? all those uh, plans. Okay. How about you, Jayton? What is your own opinion about uh, the resumption of face-to-face -face classes? Um, well, I think that because it's a regional talk, we all have different contexts, and I think. Uh, all of us are, are weighing the safety measures, are weighing uh, our local and national government's response to the pandemic. We're also trying to weigh public opinion in our own country. Um, a lot of the areas with low COVID cases are clamoring the loudest for resumption of face-to-face -face classes. And there's enough um, international research that says that we should, if we can, we should. But I think um, for the benefit of this discussion, 
maybe the, the more important question is, is when we resume face-to-face -face classes, what will we do about our students throughout the next last one or two years? Uh, our students have changed. For most of them, their, their childhood has been stolen away from them. For most of them, um, they are behind developmentally more than ever before. So much so that we can't even say no child left behind since so many have been already left behind uh, due to, not due to our own fault, but because a lot of us in Asia have, didn't have the infrastructure to support online learning. So while we are waiting for um, the shifts, uh, I guess the challenge between the teachers is, will we be able to create committees in our school systems which are preparing for this particular learning crisis? Will we be able to um, catch all of the students who are maybe in grade seven, but really have a grade four reading ability? Are students who, who were mentally um, spent, will we be able to catch them in our system? Will we have the infrastructure? Um, I believe that in most cases, it's a, it's a, it's a call of leadership, that the principals of our school uh, have to be able not only to build towards the present, but also to be able to invest in the future and try to understand if the little experiments that we've done in our own um, ecosystems, could this be something that we can bring up about nationally? In the Philippines, which, which, is, um, which is made of thousands of islands, we often work in different silos. And I think now more than ever, um, in our different local and in, in national communities, we all have to come together and try to create a manual of best practices because we need to understand not only we need to understand not only to um, distribute education in these emergency times, but we need to try to understand how we can make our systems better than they were pre-pandemic. We have a lot of opportunity now. Um, I believe that that uh, the ingenuity, the innovation. The hope that people like Ms. Yolanda and um, our, our friend from Thailand has posed uh, is something that we need to cultivate and try to institutionalize. Because if we go back to how it was before, it might be easier, but it necessarily might not be better. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for those thoughts, uh, Jayton. You know, I think it has been said that we will never go back to the way things were before the pandemic. No? And I think now there's greater ownership. That statement used to make people very sad, very discouraged. You know, people continued to long to go back to the times before the pandemic. But I think uh, because of lessons learned, because of our own experiences, we see that there are many things related to the pandemic and how we address the issues brought about the, by the pandemic that we can bring with us into the future. However, as you so rightfully pointed out, Jayton, there are important questions to address. Just as there are important lessons to note, there are very important lessons to address. So it's not a matter of going back or not going back. No? It's not a matter of uh, simply opening schools again to face-to-face -face classes or maintaining online and invest uh, online learning and investing some more so that uh, more children will have access no, to these teaching learning modalities or so no. And I think our session this afternoon have shown us that rehashing old technology is actually an important consideration, okay? Um, it's not really moving backwards. I mean, some of us might think that because we have started to use two-way radios, you know, FB Messenger or printed modules that we're going backwards, but no. Um, we want to address the needs of the students who have been entrusted to our care and addressing their needs 
means understanding their context. And so if these are the technologies that will be helpful for them, that will allow us to teach them and form them and prepare them for the future, then that's it. We have actually seen how old technologies can be very helpful in bridging the gaps that have been created no, by the pandemic, especially in under-resourced environment. Okay? So with those thoughts, I think we can proceed. We'd like to uh, bring back uh, Sir Vignesh on the screen. This third session in the webinar series allows us to have this additional session no? uh, to bring things together. It's a pleasure to be back on the screen and having heard the inspiring stories from today's three speakers, uh, I think it will give us a good opportunity maybe for us to discuss a little bit uh, what we ourselves learned uh, during these three sessions the ideas that were shared, uh, not just by our speakers, but I think also by our audience. You know, we, we asked them questions, we ran polls, and I think the information that we gathered from the polls was certainly very insightful. Uh, it gave both of us and my, and my colleagues, our speakers, a better understanding. I think as uh, Jayton pointed out earlier, we have an audience from across the region and actually across the world. Uh, we've had people listening in from all over. And it's interesting to see the perspective. So let me just quickly share some of the slides that uh, summarize some of these polls. Uh, so this was the question that we were asking our participants yesterday, uh, sorry, last week during our second session. And uh, Dr. Camilla, maybe you would like to share your thoughts. I mean, what, what did you feel when, when you came across these numbers? Are these indicative of conversations you've had? I actually found this question very uh, enlightening, Vignesh. No? Um, I, 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 before this poll, I thought that many of us would say that the students learned more than what they would have learned through face-to-face -face classes because there were many more opportunities, you know, uh, between synchronous and asynchronous sessions. There was so much more that we could engage our students with. So they could learn things that were not necessarily constrained to the 40 or 50 minute or one hour classes. So I really thought no, that um, students would have learned more through the current modalities, but I think I was wrong. But perhaps we, uh, have also maintained our previous sense of what learning is, our previous sense of what schooling no, is. Mm -hmm. So maybe we still imagine physical classrooms and classrooms where there was a teacher and students and interacting with one another and classes uh, governed by um, tight schedules throughout the day. And in that sense, perhaps, there's really a bit less of what transpired. Okay, so what do you yeah, think? I think, I think you touch on a very important point. I think often, you know, when the pandemic first struck, obviously the medical and the health crisis was the primary issue that most governments had to deal with. But as we looked at education, and of course, schools were often suspended, uh, communities were asked to stay home to remain safe. We had this sense, you know, that schools played this very technical role. They just taught, they just informed students about curriculum. They just imparted the curriculum to students. But I think there was a much larger role that schools played, a role that maybe many of us um, failed to, to fully understand and appreciate on the onset of the pandemic. So if you moved teaching and learning online, you assume that that same amount of curriculum could be delivered, right? It could be delivered through synchronous and asynchronous means and remotely. But delivering the curriculum and actual learning by the students, I think was, this, was different. And that's where, you know, during last week, when we heard from our speakers and when they spoke about how you need to understand the needs of the community before you decide on the technology, right? Professor Banha was sharing with us, you know, who are we trying to serve? What are the learning needs of the students? What are their preferred ways of learning, right? Technological solutions are simply just that. They are just 
technology, they just enable us. But we must understand what is it that, how are our students learning and what sort of technologies would be best to help our students learn. And I think that to me was important because these numbers on their own are one thing, but my big worry is that what's going to happen in five to 10 years when students who have lived through a year or two of a pandemic with reduced learning, with less hours in the classroom, some instances not having been in a classroom for more than a year and a half, what's going to happen when these students reach graduation? Uh, as Jayton pointed out, right? We are going to go back, you know, maybe next year, maybe a year down the road, we will go back to classrooms. And these students are of a certain age where they are in grade six or they are in grade eight, but maybe they have only learned enough to be in grade four. What happens then? How does our systems adapt? So that is another issue that I think is very important, especially for policymakers. You know, how do we adapt and how do we respond to this potential learning loss? And I, I think, think this also... I'm sorry. Yeah, please carry on. Oh, yeah. And I think, Vignesh, this is somehow also reflected on the questions related to assessment. Now, from the very first day, we received a lot of questions on assessment. But maybe that's also because we continue to view assessment in the manner that we conducted assessments pre-pandemic. Yes. But now that's a very important question for policymakers and educators. What do we assess? How do we assess? Why do we assess? No? And yes. in the end, this should relate to what we want to prepare our students for, yes. what kind of future we want yep. our students to be prepared for. Yeah, I think, and Dr. Trang touched on this during her summary in the first session, where she said, you know, this pandemic, it gives us an opportunity to rethink, you know, what, what really do we want out of education? What do our children want to learn? What is it our youth are equipping themselves with? And what is the future going to look like? So when we assess, what are we assessing for? Are we assessing for viability and suitability for a world that's no longer going to exist? A world that has changed drastically? So I think these are questions that we have to be thinking about. And, you know, when we also were looking at at this, I think, you know, as we accepted the reality that remote learning was nonetheless going to have to replace a lot of face-to-face -face learning because of the pandemic, we also asked the question, you know, what, what were the sort of needs that were students asked? And this, I believe, was raised during the very first session, right? And here mm -hmm. you saw, uh, you know, the answers are quite equitably spread, but I think a, a large percentage were talking a lot about the training for parents and guardians to support mm -hmm. students at home. And I think this came as a surprise to me, right? You know, mm -hmm. we, we were asking what support the school needed, but really it was, was our, were our parents equipped to be able to help students through this remote home-based learning? And I think that was something that we have seen in communities all over the world, not just in, you know, Southeast Asia, where parents had to juggle with they themselves having to work from home during this pandemic and supporting their students during their learning. So maybe as a society, what more can we do to empower our parents to be able to be co-teachers, to be able to help in the, and assist their students through the education process? And Dr. Kamela, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I like how you put it, no? that parents and guardians will now be co-teachers. Um, see, uh, I, I, I think whatever shape the curriculum will take no? for the future, uh, We'll also have to include the parents now. No, I, I, I don't think we should continue to view the curriculum as a set of learning objectives and content that a teacher and the school will have to deliver and be responsible for. I think it will now be a set of learning outcomes that um, both the school and the home should be co-responsible for. And, and, you know, Vignesh, we have had a lot of professional development programs for teachers, you know, even further studies for teachers. I wonder what we should do now so that we also handhold our parents um, towards fulfilling this responsibility because they were never taught how to be teachers, right? Yes. I, I think we have to seriously think about this, you know, because education is changing. And the pandemic might just be a precursor to major disruptions in education as we know it. And the role of parents is going to be very critical. But in many societies, if we don't equip parents with the necessary yeah. skills, 
we may end up exasperating a lot of the inequalities that already exist in our society. You know, so, so we have to be sensitive and I think policymakers must be thinking, if you, if you have to, how are you going to bring parents into the education system and how are you going to equip parents? Because most parents definitely want what is best for their child, but not all of them may have the ability to deliver that. But if we give them the opportunities, you know, professional development, learning opportunities, educational opportunities, even possibly open access webinars, Mm -hmm. Would that be sufficient to give them the skills for the majority, give them the skills so that they can help their children through this remote learning period? Because the worry will always be, would then this dependence on parents exasperate some of today's inequalities in society, inequalities that can potentially become very big problems. True. And And that's an important point. Yes, and, and I, I fully agree. And I think it also goes back a little bit, right? What's the main reason that this was the question that we asked today, right? What's the main reason behind learning loss caused by the COVID-19? And these again speak to some issues of inequality because you talk about the lack of resources, the lack of ability to train teachers to use resources, right? Non-priority of education continuity by the government. But I think if you see that the, the real two problems, right, is instructional materials and devices. Now that's a resource issue. And then you have the training issue, right? Once again, is this an issue that may be at the heart of it, an issue of inequality? Or is it an issue of resourcefulness? Because when I see this, I also come to remember what Oscar, our speaker during the first session had shared, how his school in Indonesia was struggling with having access to uh, appropriate devices and also uh, suitable Wi-Fi connectivity, and they turned to the Air Force. Now, I would have never thought uh, to turn to the military to support educational needs, but certainly his ingenuity and, and his schools to turn to the Air Force helped them deal with some of these problems that could potentially have been exasperated if they were not quickly addressed. So, Memel, your thoughts on that? Yeah. And, you know, I think this particular question also connects to the previous question. If we put in another choice, like, for example, lack of training for parents, maybe some members of our audience would have um, checked that as well. See, we were saying a while ago that parents are now an important component of the teaching learning process. And... In under-resourced environments, that's really a very big challenge. I mean, how can parents who never completed elementary help their children with lessons in grade five or six or even high school? That's really very, very difficult. So um, I tend to agree in this case that um, really, you know, learning loss has to be addressed. But we also have to go back to what learning is. No? Maybe we, just as we will soon be coming up with new definitions for classrooms and class lists and class schedules, it would also be helpful to come up with new conceptualizations for learning, teaching, and assessment. Do you think so, Vignesh? Yes, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, you mentioned this during the second session and it's an often attributed quote to Winston Churchill, never waste Mm. a good crisis. You know, the pandemic, I I think education has unfortunately been one of those sectors that we know needs to adapt, we know it needs to change, but change has always been very incremental. Oftentimes the change lag behind the change in society, the change in the economy, the change in technology, it, it was a follower, not always, especially school education, not always the leader in the change. And I think this COVID pandemic has forced us to rethink. You know, we, we are forced to acknowledge the importance of what in many societies we refer to as frontline or uh, necessary workers, right? Who keep our society running, who ensure that we have food on our table, mm-hmm. right? And what do we do? And, and are these I, um, avenues and jobs that are highly respected in society and how does our education system encourage our children to see these people, these frontliners as key drivers of our society 
And how does our education system adapt? Our assessment models, are we looking at the learning or are we looking, are we more focused on the ability to regurgitate? Mm -hmm. Are we more focused on the ability to repeat? Mm -hmm. Are we more focused on the ability to analyze? I think these are questions that the pandemic has, you know, we, we can look at it as a, as a bit of a, an opportunity for us, a, almost a sort of a hard reset in thinking about education and thinking about learning, right? We are preparing our students for jobs that the pandemic has shown even more so that we can't predict to a very large yeah. extent what's going to be looking like in 20 years, Correct. right? Correct. And, yeah. and so are we preparing them with the ability to analyze, the ability to be creative, to be innovative? I think these are questions that we have to ask. And I, and I think in this session, we unpacked quite a bit of that, did we not, Dr. Kamela? Yes, that's right. You know, Vignesh, you, you raised many questions, but I think they were very important questions to raise. You know, uh, just a while ago, I was thinking of a way to package the take away from this activity, you know, the three three day webinar series. And you know what came to mind right now is this age old wedding tradition that derives from an old English um, rhyme. I don't know if you're familiar with that in Singapore. I'm referring to the something old, something new, something borrowed and something blue. And uh, if you're familiar with that, this actually represents the four lock bringing objects a bride is advised to include somewhere in her wedding outfit or carry with her on her wedding day. And so Vignesh, if you'll permit me, as we leave the webinar series, I think you know, I'd like to say to our audience that we also bring with us something old, something new, something borrowed, and something blue. Uh, I think it was Mom Yolanda who said, old is gold, and she emphasized how old technologies can actually be brought to good use now, no? such as radio-based instruction. Or, you know, Dale also uh, made mention about making telephone calls to reach out to students. But we also bring with us uh, many, many new ideas, like what you reiterated a while ago, Oscars uh, forging partnerships with the community, including the Air, Air Force Base. Forging partnerships is not new, but doing it with the Air Force Base was something new to me. Uh, then all the online tools that were introduced by Banhar on, or the use of the uh, Facebook Messenger, no, as uh, suggested mm -hmm. by Sabrina. And we also take home with us things we can borrow, like the materials of the center represented by Trang or oh, yeah. Simeo Inutec. And finally mm -hmm. today, we take with us something blue. Blue is said to be the color of hope, particularly in Christian arts. And we really hope no, that our webinar series somehow inspires all of us to carry on with a sense of hope. What do you think about those big bears? Yes, something I, can, old, I couldn't something... agree more, Dr. Camilla. I, I couldn't agree more. I think there's something there and, and it's a rhyme I'm familiar with too. Ah, okay. And, and, I think, and I think what you've shared is certainly something that I hope our audience will be able to take with them as they leave this webinar series. And Dr. Carmela, on behalf of the Head Foundation, let me take this opportunity once again to thank you for your insights as a moderator during these three sessions. Thank you very much for moderating the three sessions and this series. And Ladies and gentlemen, all of us, thank you very much, Vignesh. You're most welcome, Dr. Carmela. And ladies and gentlemen, before I close this session and before I close our webinar series, Bridging the Gaps in Remote Learning, I'd like to thank you for participating and for attending. Many of you attended all three sessions, even on Facebook Live and through the Zoom platform. Thank you very much. I hope you found the insights shared by our speakers to be helpful in your practice as educators across the region. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be publishing a handbook that will accompany this webinar series. In the handbook, we will be expounding on the ideas that our speakers shared we will be providing you with some of the tips and suggestions numerated so that you could try it on your own. If you'd like to make reference to some of these handbooks, we have two available on our website that you can visit and download from. The first handbook looked at educational leadership in a crisis, and the second looked at building a positive school culture in the new normal. Ladies and gentlemen, in the chat box, you will see that my colleagues have shared some links 
that for those of you who wish to receive certificates of participation, please do fill out the form available on the link. And please do visit our website and visit our YouTube channel where you get recordings of this previous sessions and previous Making Headway series. Ladies and gentlemen, also do visit our website for those of you who may be interested in issues around sustainability and climate change, as the Head Foundation will be hosting its second webinar as part of a series on sustainability and the climate crisis. More information will be available on our website and you can register to participate in that webinar. And on behalf of my colleagues and the Head Foundation, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and have a pleasant evening. Goodbye.